Hi, welcome to Rancho Los Cerritos. We are a national, state, and local historic landmark located in Long Beach, California. We're so excited to have you here. Normally, when visitors come, they only get one tour guide, but today you'll be meeting six of our living history docents who will take you on a tour of the rancho to share its multiple layered history of the site. Before we meet our first docent, we would like to acknowledge that this five acre site is located on the ancestral and current homelands of the Tongva Gabrielino indigenous people who are the past, present, and future caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. We honor and extend our respects to the many indigenous people who call these lands home. As an historic site, our mission is to honor diverse perspectives, enrich collaborative conversations, and inspire broader understanding through stewardship of Rancho Los Cerritos' natural and cultural history. Our goal is to cultivate an inclusive and sustainable world by exploring the historic connections between people and place. Are you ready to get started? Let's go. Bienvenidos amigos a mi casa, Rancho Los Cerritos. Mi nombre es Rafaela Cota de Tempo. I was born at Santa Barbara Presidio in 1812. My father was a Spanish soldier. When I was nine years old, Mexico gained its independence from Spain, and we Californians became Mexicanos. I was 18 years old when I married an American businessman from Massachusetts, John Temple. He was a captain of his own whaling ship. He came and settled in El Pueblo de Los Angeles. We have a mercantile store here. We will soon get blessed with the arrival of our dear daughter, Francesca. Don Juan Temple, as people call me esposo, became a Mexican ciudadano. So he could own property and territorio Mexicano. He bought this rancho from Dakota's relative for $3,000 in 1843. The following year, we hired some native men to build this beautiful Monterrey colonial style house. It's made of sand rice adobe bricks. It took the men about two years to construct. The adobe serves as a headquarter for our cattle ranch. We stacked the land, 27,000 acres, with 15,000 vacas or cows. Since we live in Los Angeles, we hired a mayordomo, El Señor Jose Rocco, to oversee the ranch operations. Many vaqueros live here, and some of them have families. There were probably 30 people living here all together. Let's go see the mayordomo's room. Este es el cuarto del mayordomo. It looked like, like he did when El Señor Rocco managed our rancho. Look at the tallow candelas. The right high chair. Oh, here my husband Bram denied J. T. John Temple. This adobe was a witness to the economic, social, and political changes that took place in Alta California during the late 1840s. When this territory was embroidered in a warfare, during the hostility, the adobe was occupied at different times by both sides. At one point, my esposo and I, we came here to stay out of hard ways. I brought two barrels of scum powders with us to help the Californians. Another time the rancho served as una prisión 
for American prisoners of war. I myself was not in favor of the Americans take this land by force. But when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848, about half of Mexico becomes part of the United States. Men like Miss Fosso has to prove they own their land. He was successful, but many others were not. Gold was discovered in California in 1848, just as the treaty was signed. That brought a dozens of gold seekers from around the world. Within two years, California became the 31st state in the Union, a free state that did not allow slavery. I suppose that led to another war as you probably already know. Also in 1860s, terrible weather here in California, both frogs and droughts, put many ranchers out of business. We survived Los Tiempos Difficiles, but my esposo decided to retire. In 1866, we sold this adobe in 27,000 acres ranch to Flint, Bisbee, and company, who were cheap ranchers. Hello, my name is Jotham Bixby. I lived in this rancho for about 15 years with my wife and our family. That was back in the 1860s and 70s. Let me tell you how we came to own this rancho and what life was like at the time. Many of the men in my family came to California during the gold rush. When we got to the gold fields, we found feeding the miners was more reliable than panning gold for ourselves. My brother Llewellyn and our cousin Benjamin Flint purchased the butcher shop where Llewellyn worked, and we all saved enough money to buy the Rancho San Justo. We bought sheep from the Midwest and business thrived. The Flint Bixby and Company could now purchase a second rancho, this one. In 1866, Flint, Bixby & Company bought Rancho Los Cerritos from Mr. John Temple for $20,000 in gold. I became the manager of the ranch under the condition that I have the option to buy in. By 1869, I owned half of this rancho. We had about 25 or 30,000 head of sheep, and I hired some very capable Basque sheep herders who had well-trained sheepdogs to tend to the flocks. Twice a year, several dozen sheep shearers would come to this ranch to shear the wool. And the sheep shearers earned about five cents per fleece, earning about two dollars a day, a fair pay in those days. Once the sheep were shorn, the wool was shipped back to East to the textile factories in large burlap sacks like this one. And the sheep were sent to the pasture for another six months. When I moved into the adobe, I found Mr. Temple had a right strong building. I had never lived in an adobe building before or since. We didn't have them in Maine. However, I found the flat tar roofs leaked. This type of roof was popular in Mr. Temple's day, but we are not going to live in a building that leaks. I replied, replaced the original roof with a good New England style that was pitched and shingled. No dripping rainwater in the winter and no dripping tar in the summer. 
this room was built as a blacksmith shop. It has a forge for sizing horseshoes and making branding irons. Temple's workers must have learned from the Spanish missionaries how to build with adobe. Interestingly, the walls in this room were con constructed with those unusual openings that you see high up on the wall. This unique design helps clear the room of smoke and heat caused by the forge. In this room are carpentry tools and the ranch workers have to fix fence posts and repair furniture. When my cousin John lived with us in the rancho, he used the tools to build a bookcase for our parlor. Now, my wife is interested in telling you about the domestic activities. Greetings, I'm Margaret Bixby. When my husband and I moved here in 1866, I was dismayed to find that my home was an old adobe, an adobe so far from anyone or anything. But while I share my frustration, I realize I was more fortunate than many. Although it was a pioneer life, I did have help. My most important helper was Ah Ying, our cook, who, assisted by Ah Fan, his apprentice, cooked three meals a day, every day, for up to 30 people. And speaking of food, Mr. Temple had planted an orchard behind the house when he lived here. So we had citrus fruit, oranges, lemons, limes, figs, well, we even had two long arbors of mission grapes. They were delicious. Now, we didn't have any vegetables. So once a week, a Chinese farmer would come by and he would provide us with the fresh vegetables that we would buy from him. And this gave us the vegetables and it also gave Ah Ying the chance to talk to a fellow countryman who could tell him what was happening in the Chinese community in Los Angeles. There is something troubling I would like to note here about the mistreatment of Chinese immigrants in my day. Thousands of Chinese had come for the gold rush. Thousands more had come to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. Yet, as a group, they were subject to intense discrimination, exclusion, and violence in their adopted country. Unfortunately, Los Angeles was no exception. Now, our staples came from Los Angeles, things that we bought in bulk, like flour, sugar, coffee, pinto beans. These are the things that we needed in large quantities. So once as we were running low, I would make a list for my husband, and when he went on his next trip to Los Angeles, he would purchase them. But a trip to Los Angeles, which was 16 miles away, it took three and a half hours in each direction, so needless to say, the trip wasn't made often. <clears throat> oh, meat! As you might expect with a rancho of 30,000 sheep, we had mutton frequently made its way to our table. But we also had plenty of chickens, we had fish in the river, and we did raise some steer for beef. Why don't I take you to the dining room so I can uh, tell you how we enjoyed this bounty. Three times a day, a triangular dinner gong was sounded to tell everyone it was mealtime. After everyone washed up at the tin wash tub just outside the door, and we women and our girls put on our white aprons, we sat down to eat. Now, the dining room wasn't just a place for eating but also for conversation and to teach our children proper manners. Breakfast, it consisted of eggs, meat, potatoes, stewed fruit, and coffee. Dinner, our largest meal, was at noon. It was soup, meat, more potatoes, two vegetables, bread with, and bread with preserves. 
Now, we had hearty appetites because we worked hard here at the rancho, whether tending sheep, mending clothes, or rearing our children, there was always plenty of work to do. But supper in the evening was a much lighter meal. It consisted of porridge or cream toast, but every meal included cheese and Ayings, wonderful donuts. Now, we Bixby's were of New England stock, so we kept our spices to salt and pepper. Our workmen, though, loved spicy food, so uh, Yang cooked with chilies and garlic and the like for them. Something that was never served at any meal or in between was alcohol. We Bixby's were part of the temperance movement, to the point that when Jotham started selling and leasing the land, in the lease it was written, it would be null and void if alcohol were found on the property. Now, at the end of every meal, we would wrap our napkins up and put them back in our napkin rings to hopefully be used for an entire week before they had to be sent to the laundry room. Our cooks also did the laundry, a very arduous task since we had no plumbing or electricity when we lived here. We were so fortunate to have Ah Ying and Ah Ben work for us. They soon became essential members of our household. When we moved from the rancho, Ah Ying stayed on here as a tenant, and Ah Ben became a cook at another rancho. You know, despite my dismay when we first moved here, the years spent at the rancho were good ones. It was a good place to raise my children, and it was nice to be part of the early growth of what was later to become Long Beach. Hello, I'm Sarah Bixby Smith. We are now upstairs in the main house, and this is my cousin Harry's room. Harry was born in 1870. I was born the following year. When I visited the rancho as a young girl, Harry and I spent our days playing in the garden and the orchard and the barn. Harry loved to collect bird eggs. I think that was his favorite pastime. We also enjoyed playing cards, dominoes, and marbles. On the wall, there's a picture of me, my little sister, Anne, and Harry. Oh, the McGuffey's Reader. This was a primer series. I remember the next one was always harder than the last. After I moved from Rancho San Justo near Monterey to Los Angeles, I attended public school. Harry, living here at the rancho, was tutored at home from McGuffey's Reader. My doll Elizabeth. Oh, how I loved her. She was a gift from my great great grandmother Hathaway. She was so precious to me. My little toy stove, too. Oh, I remember. One time, Harry and I wanted to use it like a real stove. We stuffed it with paper and lit it with a candle. When the room got real smoky, we decided to get help. Well, Harry was a little bit more clever than me. While I went to go summon our mothers, Harry scampered out the window. We also enjoyed listening to the stories of our grandfather Hathaway when he moved here from Maine. This space served as Uncle Jotham's office in the 1870s. My brother renovated this old adobe in the 1930s. This became his library. My brother and his wife Avis loved to read books in here and listen to the radio. Did I happen to mention that I grew up to be a writer and a poet? It's true. I wrote a book about the Ranchos Los Cerritos when I visited as a little girl. 
I wonder if it's in the catalog. Let me check. Ah, it's here. Let me find it on the shelf. Dolby Days, Dolby Days. Ah, here it is. In Adobe Days, I also write about my grandfather, the Reverend George Hathaway. He moved to California in 1877 when he retired from the ministry. I loved his sermons. I even benefited from his conviction that children, girls, and boys should learn to read and write. My grandfather, he was a proud abolitionist. He sheltered runaway slaves as part of the Underground Railroad back in Maine. He was also a chaplain for the Union Army during the Civil War. His daughter, my Aunt Martha, came out west with him. Back in Maine, she was a school teacher, but here, she helped raise me and my siblings when my mother, her sister, passed. Aunt Martha, we called her our vice mother. This painting of Uncle Jotham reminds me, many people called him the father of Long Beach, even though it wasn't his idea to create a city. That fellow was named William Wilmore. Wilmore leased several thousand of acres of Rancho Los Cerritos land with the intention of founding Wilmore City. It was his idea that created the city of Long Beach. Uncle Jotham and Aunt Margaret gave money to parks and schools as well as the first congregational church. Uncle Jotham and Aunt Margaret, when they moved to the city of Long Beach in 1880, rented this adobe out. First, it was a dairy, then a boarding house. Eventually, it was an apartment building. During that period, the adobe was rented to those who worked at neighboring farms or at the golf club next door. Before you meet my brother Llewellyn, I am sure you are interested in hearing some of the stories from one of our tenants. Hello, my name is Manuel Vieira. I would like to welcome you into my humble home. Well, it used to be my home. I moved here in 1922 when I was about 22 years old at the time, and I had been living with my aunt nearby. I moved into an apartment in this old adobe with my parents and younger siblings. Soon after, I got a job at the groundskeeper over at the country club next door. This portion of the adobe looked very different at that time. First of all, it had two floors. My family's apartment had a large room upstairs and several bedrooms and a kitchen downstairs. The apartment across the hallway here is where my future wife Concepcion used to live with her family. And I first met her at the golf club before I moved in with my parents. She had gone there to fetch some water since there was no indoor plumbing here at the Adobe. My oh my, she was a lovely sight. Recorded for about two years. As I said, the top floor here used to be one large room. And it's where we hosted our wedding reception in 1924. But it was so grand. I hear people still have weddings here, but I like to think that ours was the best one here at Catancho. You know, we had about 80 guests and great music from an orchestra. You should have seen it. We danced, we did the foxtrot, we celebrated until almost one in the morning, and we served chicken enchiladas you know, from the chickens that I raised myself here at the rancho. My employer over at the country club gave us our wedding cake, and my coworkers helped us run the electrical cable from the clubhouse all the way to our house here. Let me show you. You can see the country club, right? Right over there? 
Well, we ran an extension cord all the way over here. My wife Concepcion was the happiest bride ever with all her family and friends. Together we had a great time here at the rancho. Well, we like to call it our rancho. Concepcion and I spent the first few years of our marriage here. In fact, our oldest daughter, Rosie, was born while we lived here. If memory serves me right, we paid about $10 a month for rent here. You know, those were the happy years. Back then, there was no door that would lead you to the country club like you see now, right over there. That door was made especially for Mr. Bigsby when he lived here. Those cypress trees by the walkway over there were here when we lived here, along with the black locust trees on the side of the house. Our gardens were not landscaped like the ones you see here today because we grew much of our food here. You know, I built a chicken coop that could hold over well over 100 chickens, you know, minus the 25 that came to our wedding. You know, I also planted corn, herbs, and spices like jalapenos and chiles de algo. You know those little red hot peppers? You know, I hunted for rabbits here. I would get about 25 cents per rabbit. And I used that money to buy books. I loved reading and learning, and I still do. We moved to the caretaker's cottage at the country club when Llewellyn Bixby bought the property and remodeled it. We were glad when it later became a museum that we could visit, and indeed we did. Concepcion and I celebrated over our 70th wedding anniversary here in 1994, coming full circle. You know, over the years, we were asked by the museum staff to talk about our memories of living at Rancho Los Cerritos. They recorded us on tape about three or four times between 1968 and 1989. We were always happy to participate as we walked through the gardens and reminisced about our time here. We have so many memories but I'm not going to bore you anymore with my old stories, but I do hope you enjoy the rancho as much as we did. Thank you for stopping by. Hello, I'm Llewellyn Bakesby II. I'm standing outside the sun porch of this adobe that my wife Avis and I remodeled in 1930 and moved into in, on St. Patrick's Day, 1931. I always felt that preserving the adobe was something the Bixby family ought to do. And the project was in the back of my mind for many years. Finally, I purchased the adobe from the Jilton Bixby Company for a dollar, and then the work began. Now, our needs for the adobe were much different from previous families living here. We wanted to retain as much as possible style, flavor, and historical details of both the house and the gardens, but needed a modern home with plumbing, heating, electricity, and a telephone. The architects submitted several plans and we chose the least formal and the most relaxed. Now, as it turned out, the most important thing for things about the uh, remodel are things that we can't see. I was trained as a civil engineer, so I took a great interest in the designs for the earthquake retrofit. The architect brought on structural engineers to reinforce the old adobe walls. The engineers designed systems that stabilized the walls. There are concrete and iron rebar beams, uh, iron straps embedded in walls over windows and doors, and concrete slabs extending beyond the exterior of the building. Now that sun porch was added during the remodel as a convenient weatherproof um, alternate way to move from room to room and became a much loved and much used living area. Oh, during excavation, circular carved stones were found, uh, or actually unearthed. Scholars call them cogstones. The actual function of the cogstones is unknown, but their presence indicates that people lived in this area and on this land. 5,000 years. This is our living room. When my uncle Joseph and later Tanner lived here, this living room was three rooms. There was one large second story bedroom, and downstairs was a bedroom and a parlor. My design opened it up to make this grand and comfortable living space with its fireplace and electric sconces chandelier, and detailed blue. Uh, in 1933, Long Beach experienced a devastating 6.4 magnitude of Tremors were felt from San Diego to winter. Damage to our city and surrounding communities 
was extensive. Homes were shaken off their foundations. Roofs and walls on schools and businesses collapsed. Damage to schools was so extensive, the state of California almost immediately passed the field act, mandating earthquake safe designs and construction of school buildings. Most of the damage was the result of unreinforced brick walls crumbling in the way. Many people lost their lives due to falling bricks. Yet there was little damage here at the ranch. The care taken with the seismic work during construction literally saved the building. Well, we lost some big holes. This fireplace separated slightly from the wall. But structurally, the building was sound. Now I'd like to take you outside and show you several historic details that are preserved for their importance to our family. Welcome to the veranda. Perhaps you have a family growth chart on a door jam or a wall inside your home. At the Adobe, it's outside. Here is our Bixby family from the 1870s. You can see why I left this exposed and not covered with stucco when the house is remodeled. I continued the tradition with our children and grandchildren. Here you can see one section of our five acres of gardens designed to preserve historical trees and shrubs alongside modern plantings. There are two trees of note that we can see from here. That Morton Bay fig has grown to a tremendous size since planted in the early 1880s. A truly remarkable tree. Preserving this Italian cypress required curving the pathway around it to my private gate into the Virginia Country Club next door. A golfer's dream. These gardens were Avis's pride and joy and a wonderful place for our grandchildren to explore. Avis and I loved our years at the Rancho. This old adobe was our home and our retreat. We are delighted to see that it has survived and thrived for visitors to enjoy so many years from its humble beginnings. In addition to the tours of the Adobe Home and Historic Gardens, visitors are also treated to engaging and innovative exhibitions related to the Rancho Los Cerritos history and the modern community of Long Beach. Right here in the Visitor Center, our current exhibition, Roots in California Concepts of Home, shares the oral histories of the Mexican and Mexican-American residents who lived and worked here at Rancho Los Cerritos over 100 years ago, and we compare those stories to its modern counterparts to today. Our curator, Carlos Ortega, will take you behind the scenes to take you on a tour of how this exhibition came to be. Hi, my name is Carlos Ortega. I'm curator at Rancho Los Cerritos, and today I'm going to give you a behind the scenes tour of our current exhibition, Roots in California, Concepts of Home. This exhibition is the first exhibition that focuses solely on Mexican and Mexican-American history and the project was sponsored by the National Endowment of the Humanities. The exhibition compares and contrasts historical and contemporary perceptions of home. So we used oral histories of the Mexican-American tenants that lived at the rancho between 1890s and the 1930s, and we compare them with five stories of people living in California today. The oral histories came from recordings that previous curators did in the 1960s and in the 1980s, and the contemporary stories came from us reaching out to over 200 nonprofits that deal with social justice and immigration issues, and we sent them a questionnaire asking them um, uh, what is a story that was meaningful to you, how did that relate to your ancestry, and we asked them to share their roots with us as well. We were looking for inspirational 
uh, uplifting stories uh, that deal with the concepts of home. It is important to analyze the way that the Mexican and Mexican American tenants lived at this site because their history and their stories were overlooked since the 1960s. The emphasis was more put into knowing how the site and the buildings uh, were preserved rather than on the stories that of the people who lived in here. And it is important to do so because the history and the stories of these immigrant tenants is a reflection of American history. The Mexican and Mexican American tenants who lived here in the 1890s lived in a building with no electricity, no light, no running water, and the, the floors were just dirt. They lived in precarious conditions while the rest of the population did live with such amenities, amenities that we enjoy uh, today as well. Since the tenants living in the site didn't have many resources, the, the building lack the basic uh, amenities. They had to be their resilience and they came out with different ways to entertain themselves. Uh, they built their own radios when, as a form of entertainment. The kids would create their own toys out of soap bars and other items and um, Whenever something needed to be built, uh, they were the ones who created. There was no access to the second floor of the building, and uh, Manuel Liera built a second set of uh, staircases in order to have access from the other area of the adobe home. While the tenants that lived at the rancho were treated as second-class citizens, there are many similarities that we can see in the videos that they will display in the exhibition today. The modern stories reflect issues of gentrification, like Daniel, who uh, grew up in an area of Los Angeles that uh, is historically um, underrepresented and that with people who struggle in Echo Park, um, and how gentrification changed the landscape of the site and forced him and his family to move to a different area, Southgate, where he decided to open his own coffee shop that was solely focused on Latinos and offering products from Latin America. Um, there are other issues like um, Santos, who had a good job in Mexico and when he crossed the border, uh, because of language difficulties, uh, he had to work at a restaurant uh, cleaning dishes. The treatment and marginalization that Mexican and Mexican Americans suffered a hundred years ago continues today. There are people who suffer displacement, gentrification, and the struggles of developing their own concepts of home. And the videos in the exhibition highlight and explore those connections between the past histories and the present. We wanted to develop this exhibition with the help of the community and integrate art into the historical exhibition as well. 
Uh, we reach out to local artist uh, Gloria Sanchez, who is half Filipina, half uh, Mexican, and we ask her to develop a safe space where people could sit down and share their own perceptions and concepts of home. Uh, what Gloria did was she reached out uh, to social media and um, asked people to send her photographs of what home meant to them. Either if it was uh, people, uh, plant relatives, a place, or pets. And what people did was send us hundreds and hundreds of photographs of what their view of home is. What Gloria did with these photographs is later on integrating them in different areas of the exhibition. Like for example in these curtains where you can see photographs that people sent us. And also in some of the pillows where she also inserted inspirational messages such as home is a safe place, sisterhood, and juntos, which means uh, together. When developing this safe space, Gloria wanted to make everybody feel at home, so she recreated a living room where there are familiar elements for anyone coming in. Uh, we all have um, a perception or a view of what home means, and this was one that usually transcends its cultures. She integrated photographs of her family, the Filipino side of, that's her mom with all the relatives, and her dad with one of the early pets that she ever had. And the idea of this space was again to make everybody feel comfortable and at home. We wanted to extend the experience of the exhibition beyond the physical space of the exhibition. So for that purpose, we created small seed packages. These are all plants from our native gardens and they are California native plants that people can take home. And the idea was to encourage people to grab one of these packages and share it with people uh, who make them feel at home or to have an experience with your family or those who you love and, and do an activity together that goes beyond, um, that expands the conversation of what home means to you. Thank you for spending your day with us today and learning all about Rancho Los Cerritos' history. If you're ever in Long Beach, we'd love to meet you in person. Bye!